Welcome to the Don't Count Me Out podcast. This program is dedicated to stroke survivors, loved ones, and caregivers, medical professionals, and anyone interested in learning more about this devastating disease and the warriors that face it every day. Our mission is to share stroke survivor stories of inspiration and hope, form friendships and community, gain knowledge and insights, and the courage to dream and explore new avenues as we find our way back to living. So my friends, the Don't Count Me Out podcast begins right now. Linda, we were talking a little bit about your background. Why don't we start there and you can let people know who you are. Hi, I'm Melinda Wade. I started in the theater in New York and as always was my first love. My father was amongst other things, he was a theater critic in LA, in Los Angeles where I'm from. And he actually did it so that he could afford to take us to the theater. He loved going to plays and he loved taking my sister and I to plays. So he would be able to get free tickets if he was a theater critic. So that was like the initial like sort of impetus. And I have such fond memories of my father taking us to uh, the Ashland, Oregon Shakespeare Festival. I always say that I was probably one of the only like 10 year olds who had seen all of Shakespeare's plays by the time they were 10 years old. And my dad would whisper, he would whisper as it was going on the plot of of something like Richard the (laughs) third in my ear. So that love of theater was always there. When I moved to New York, it became very clear pretty early on that that great love of theater was not going to manifest in something that was going to have me live in Mm -hmm. New York. (laughs) I got an agent for voiceovers and I started doing regular voiceovers, just commercials and things like that. And I was always doing commercials and TV and film, but I started making more and more money this way. And I remember I did, used to do for Pfizer Pharmaceutical, I used to do a lot of their audio work for doctors and nurses. So I got very used to also speaking in kind of a medical way so that people could hear me and understand what I was talking about. And then one day there was somebody who was famous who was fired from an audio book. I'm not going to say who or which company. The audio book company called my agent and said, who do you have? And she sent me in and I got it. And I've never been more panicked in my life. I was like, I have to speak for that many hours a day. How is my voice going to hold up? And I remember going to Whole Foods and like getting the spray that opera singers use and all of that. I was terrified. I was like, my voice is going to go out. But I also really loved it. And that started the journey of doing audiobooks. And then when I moved to LA because of my husband's work, it was really clear that TV and film and everything was sort of drying up for me, but audiobooks weren't. Mm. So I threw everything out of a closet and we built a studio. And then eventually I got enough jobs that my husband found an actual booth, an audio booth that was delivered to the house. Yeah, LA became our home for many reasons, for work, but also my parents are getting older. So it's really nice for me to be near them. I was the only sibling that was near the the family. So that was one of the other reasons too. And then the pandemic really kind of was a wonderful way to do audiobooks because I didn't leave the house and I was safe and I could work from home and just go into the booth, work for a few hours, go walk around the block a few times, come back in, you know. So that's really how it started. It started in New York as a fluke. And then I picked it up again when I moved out to LA. And it's just been something that's been very kind to me that I've enjoyed doing. I've done a lot of really interesting books. Some of them have been medical, some of them been more business. One of the things you asked me was about pacing. And that's something that I am familiar with because you Mm -hmm. actually have to honor that people have to understand you and that they have to be able to follow you. (laughs) So that was something that I think that I really understood Mm -hmm. about what you were looking for. And plus my daughter used to have a really bad lisp Uh and I had to take her to speech therapy for almost a year. So I worked with her a lot and I actually have a couple of friends who are stroke speech therapists. So I talked to them about your book Uh and then I did some research online 
Mm -hmm. uh, watching stroke survivors. And that helped me a lot as well. There were challenges to your book that I had never seen before. And one of them was, how do I honor your voice without imitating what you were going through? Because one of the things that's difficult is that if I spoke the way you spoke when you first had the stroke, it would not be understandable necessarily to people. So what I did was between actually the research that I did and then my own work as an actor, I came to the conclusion that I would try to do it from what you were feeling internally. So if you note, and you might not notice this, it might be something just that I notice that the way I spoke when you first had the stroke in the book mm -hmm. compared to where you ended up was very different in its pacing. Mm -hmm. Because I really tried to, as if I was inside the stroke and was trying to be understood. Mm -hmm. So when you first had it, my words were slower and more deliberate than where I ended up. And and it showed. It, and that it, was, it a, really, oh, okay, because I wasn't yeah. sure, because that was a choice that I did, because mm -hmm. I was really struggling with how do I show her her progression yeah. with the stroke, but in an authentic way to me as an actor and an authentic way that people who had a stroke might feel, I understand her. I understand her physically, but I also understand her emotionally. Yeah. And so that was a, that was something I had never had encountered in an yeah. audio book before. So that was a really wonderful challenge for me. When you go through something that's as traumatic as a stroke and not knowing the outcome, because of the type of stroke I had, it was a hemorrhagic. The thing is, it was so deep within the brain that they couldn't do any surgery. There was nothing they could do for me. And so I either lived or I died. I mean, it was just as plain as that, and that's all you could say about it. For someone to step in and see that, it would be very easy to take a panic mode to the way you were going to present it and make it very dramatic. I really prayed that that wouldn't happen because part of who I am is someone who looks at a situation, try to do what ifs. You know, what if this happens? How would I respond to it? And that's the only reason I can think that I drove myself and don't anybody ever do that back to work with all the sandwiches and then to the mm -hmm. hospital. But to me, it was logical and it made sense and it took care of everything that I needed to do before I could take care of me. And it was interesting because, so that was incredibly clear in your writing. And I know we, you had mentioned that before. You were like, I don't want this to get too panic. So I really tried to stay in the moment when I was reading it, which is another thing that I think the theater offers because I think a lot of times people can get into kind of a reading mode and then that's not alive yeah. and we want to stay alive because in our in the in our presence as a as a narrator as an actor so that the listener is feels us being alive yeah. and your words were very alive your Thank words you. were very um in the moment, and I understood why you still continued getting the lunch order. And there was a lot of tremendous humor, you know, when you were at church and that story. And there were so many wonderful things that were, you know, you weren't going to put up with anybody getting in your way. And, and, and even in the, even when you were in rehab and your roommate and everything, it was just, there was so much life to it Thank that... You. It was really easy to find the dimensions that were necessary for to bring you to life. You just had to stay present. And I think that was part of going back to my decision as to how I was going to speak and how I made that beforehand. And that really helped so that I wasn't like caught up in the moment going like, is, is this right? Is this wrong? I didn't second guess. I tried not to second guess because I, you really did not want that. It's, it's such a different book as far as something that you normally would read. When I write, I try to write more like fiction so that it does become something that has a heartbeat and it brings you along without telling you what's going to happen. It felt more like mm -hmm. a memoir. And I loved it. You gave me very specifics about the characters. And all of that was incredibly helpful as well. Good. And I Thank think that you. that's something for audiobook authors. Any author who wants to do an audiobook, having the clarity over 
pronunciations and having the clarity over certain characters and why they need to have certain kinds of voices and this and that and the other. It's very important so that everybody's on the same page. One of the things that I loved about the way that you presented it is you would turn from one character to another just in a heartbeat and without even saying a word or losing any of the the emotion that was happening at the time, you knew exactly when you changed into the other person. So and you and your husband, that was a really, or when you were certain, there were certain nurses that we were having a deeper conversation with. Sometimes it was hard for me not to carry the emotion over into the other person. That was difficult. Sometimes I did have to go back or I did have to stop for a moment and give myself some time to breathe and then go, okay, let's, let's regroup. Because how someone's reaction to what was happening to you was different and I needed to get their story and their voice. And sometimes I got so caught up in your voice that I just had to turn off the mic, take a couple of deep breaths, and then I could start up again. I love the way this whole thing works. I worked for an advertising agency for a while. My job was choosing talent. So coming in and doing this, I kind of felt like it was back at work. And that was yeah. nice. <laughs> you know, and I enjoyed that. But what was it that drew you to doing this book over others? I think one of the reasons that I did like this book a lot was that I felt like there has been so much heartbreak in the world in the last few years. Yeah. And I thought there was sort of a beautiful sense of hope about this book that really made me feel like that was something that I needed. And that was a sort of a nurturing thing that made me feel really good doing it. That, I think that was probably the main reason was that, you know, when I got out of the booth every day, I felt good. I felt like I was adding something to the world mm -hmm. and that I was doing something positive for the world. And so I, in a time when it was such chaos going on with everything to do with COVID and everything else and the sort of the, the political kind of world that we're living in right now. And I felt mm. that I was just like in a small way, I was just adding something positive mm. to the world. So I think that was really probably the main reason. Uh, it's very humbling to hear you say <laughs> something like that. Thank you. It made me talk up. Um, this kind of information I'd like to share with the other authors. I know from my own journey and walking to doing the book with Find A Way, who, by the way, I think is a wonderful company. To Very me. helpful. The only thing that I find that was really difficult is I like to plan ahead. And mm -hmm. they only take you to a certain step and they expect you to finish those steps and then they'll take you on the next leg of the journey. Yeah, it's easier oh, now, but when I first started with them, I definitely was emailing them a lot. Yeah, right. Yeah. I think one of the things that I've sort of come to realize about, and I hope authors hear this in a good way. One of the things that's great about working, it's like working with a company like Find A Way. When you're an author, your words matter. You have spent months, years, money, time to put them on the page, to make them come alive. These words are so important. And it's equally important that the person you choose to narrate is good. I think that sometimes what happens is people will go cheap because they'll be like, oh, I'm going to save money and this person's pretty good. But does that person have a good editor? I think it's really important to spend a little bit more money to get a really good product because like I'm union and I believe in union performers. And there's a lot of people who will say, Linda, I don't agree with you, but my history of who I am and my work brought me to your audio book. Cause somewhere down the line, when you were listening to all the narrators, you were connected to me, but you want, and being connected to me as a, as an audiobook narrator means that you're connected to my, my work and my, in, in my history of work and my body of work and my characters and all that kind of stuff. There was something really funny that was unexpected. And I thought, I wonder if everybody gets her humor. I can't remember what it was, but there was something. And I was like, and, and it's there, it's in you. It's who you are. And, and I would say two things. So I would say to authors, try to get the best quality narrator that you can get. And if your book has humor, make sure that the person is landing the humor. Because if they're not landing the humor in the audition, they're not going to land it in the book. And your book had a lot of humor in the midst of this trauma. And it was so important to balance that. 
and not forget. And that was something that I know you wanted. I just want authors, when you're doing an audiobook, take that same time to make sure that the company you're working with and that the people you're working with are good. And that's, that's a wonderful important. point. When someone is looking at the audition tapes, and most of you had more than one, and mm -hmm. you had them divided into different genres. Yes. And sometimes I would read some of the genres, and I would switch from the genre that I thought I would like you to read in, and then maybe read something that was more uh, a romantic comedy or uh, something that was softer as far as... You liked the spiritual read. Yes. I remember that. And that was helpful for me to hear. And I yeah. think that that's part of that is your years in casting. That is another thing that's incredibly helpful to give as a piece for the author, right? So if there is one read that you would say, oh, I like that one. It's really helpful to tell the narrator. Yes, I specifically liked that read. The reason I liked that one so much was because there was a sense of awe to it. Mm -hmm. And there is when you go through something as traumatic as a life and death situation. You may be terrified, but the thing is, is that I didn't feel the terror as much as feeling the destiny of it all. I really was not the one in charge. I wasn't the one that could make the final decision on anything. Mm -hmm. I just had to work my way through it and walk through it and try to do it with as much dignity as I could find. And it also gives the author an opportunity to see what you're really capable of doing. And that is true. And that's what's, it's great that you listen to that. And that's another thing I would say to, to authors is to really take some time and listen to those samples because it might be like, oh, I need a little bit of this and I need a little bit of that. And I know you had an issue. You had an issue with the way I was portraying your husband's character. What I could have done and which I would now do is I would just do an excerpt of the way he speaks. And then I would send that off to you. Listen to this two minutes of raw footage. Is this what you want? Because I do think that it's really helpful. And I now know, and I've done many books with this company to have everybody on the exact same page in your first 15 minutes. I know I felt very comfortable being able to bring that point up to you because Bill was so integral in everything in mm -hmm. his story. And he was such a kind and gentle man. I wanted to make sure that that really came through. And it yeah. did. And that's all a part of the character development. When I sent you that one sheet of how I work, which is also on my website, you're actually quoted on my website. Oh, oh. <laughs> MelindaWadeAudio.com. Oh. <laughs> you said something really nice to me, so I put that on the, on the website. Oh, oh um, nice. Okay, so I had my train of thought and then I just lost it again. <laughs> oh, here's what I was going to say. If there is a real problem with, with the way I say a certain line, feel free to say, oh, this wasn't said with enough energy or there's supposed to be more excitement to this. Feel free. Mm -hmm. You don't mm -hmm. want to over edit an audiobook where it starts to sound kind of like this and That's not true. sound fluid. And sometimes you have to realize it's more important about the fluidity of it. And that's where you have to find the balance. Is it more important that I got every ounce of that character correct? Or is it more important that it flows and that conversation flows? That's sometimes tricky. An author has every right to say, no, I need this changed. Mm -hmm. But you just have to remember, you don't want to make so many changes that it just starts to sound like it's piecemeal together and not like a conversation. Sometimes an author, if they're new at their craft, will write it a certain way. And then when they hear the word spoken, they realize that that's not exactly how yeah. they wanted to say it. Then when they hear the narrator do this for the audiobook, they're going, well, no, maybe that's not quite the way I've wanted. Yeah, that is something that happens 
a lot. And I think that is correct. It, it is something that happens to newer authors. And I do think reading it out loud or having someone read it is it, helpful. And the other thing, too, that uh, I think came across with what you did, and a lot of people don't know this. I mentioned this for the authors, because when they are reading their work, if they want it to sound more uplifting, speak with a smile. There's oh, yes. something yeah. about smiling that makes the words just come out beautifully. There is no question. And I did learn that from doing voiceover commercials, mm -hmm. that when you're doing a commercial, I mean, it's just the difference between me talking like this. And then when I put a smile on my face, my voice just naturally is brighter. If there was one thing that you would like to see authors give to you that seems to be a common thread that runs through stuff that you receive from them, what would you ask from them? I would say, and I sort of brought this up before, is like more specificity on tone. You did a great job on that. I worked with an author and he said to me, I want you to sound like you're at a bar and you're having a drink with a friend, not two drinks, one drink. And that was really clear to me because one drink is fun. Three drinks to someone like me is sloppy, but one drink is personal and it's fun. So to me, I understood completely what he said. I understood what you said when you said, I want this to sound like this particular tone. There's an awe to that tone. I would say more than anything, be clear going in about what you want. A lot of times authors will just say, you know, you do you. How I hear it in my head might be a little bit different than the way the author hears it. I would say to the author, the more they can get clear and not be scared of the narrator and not treat the narrator like they know everything. I don't want them to beat up on the narrator and be too like controlling, but I do think coming to the table and saying, I love your work, but specifically, I think that what you do in your fantasy books is really wonderful and has a softness to that tone that I would love to see. That kind of clarity, you were great at it. Between what you said and what that other guy said, I want it to sound like it's one drink, not two. <laughs> <laughs> I understood that too, and I'm a tea holder. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't drink. For me, when I get to the bottom of the first one, I'm a little bit like, woo. But he just <laughs> wanted it to have a fun sound. Yeah. Be free to communicate with your narrator and talk to them. And at the same time, really know your voice. Know your voice as an author and what you want. No, it, it makes perfect sense. I actually, you had mentioned that, and I think that's what's in the quote is that, um, so I'm deaf in one ear. I, I don't actually, too. Oh, you are? Yeah, right or left. <laughs> uh, uh, my right ear. Mm -hmm. um, that's so interesting. So because <laughs> of that, um, but maybe that's why I don't necessarily hear the music. I feel it. It's mm -hmm. always been the way I do accents too, is that I feel it. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's a rhythm thing. I'm very, I'm acutely aware of rhythms. And I think it's because of my hearing. I do something a lot of narrators don't do, which is that once I will narrate a chapter, I will go back and I don't just proof it for words. I also proof it for pacing. That's just something maybe I'm just a little bit anal retentive. Of, right? <laughs> I, I like my sort of control over the pacing. Who is the major audience for listening to, to audio voices? It was professionals driving to work. And then the pandemic hit, I find I know a lot of people who listen to them while they're walking their dogs. I know people on road trips because road trips became more, more popular during the pandemic as well. So I think that the audiobook world has sort of blown up and there's a lot more people listening to them and in different ways now. And one of the things that I saw when I was considering doing an audiobook is not only for the stroke survivor who has no other way to read and would find this enjoyable enjoyable, but also for the professional, uh, like the nurses or the uh, yeah. physical therapists, and doctors on their way to work. When I first started writing, my hand was still so weak that when I would put it on the keys of the computer, I would get these long strings of O's or A's. I mean, mm. to the point that spell check just ignored me. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but as I went along, my hand was getting stronger and my fingers were more flexible. So it was just another way of physical therapy for me as well as being able to get the story out. 
And your vulnerability in the story was really, I think is something that was beautiful. And when you even talked about, you know, going back and helping people and you were scared, you were scared that you were going to make it worse. Yeah. And so some people weren't going to survive. And people, some people were not going to be getting out of the hospital. During the pandemic, my uh, sister's mother-in-law died of a hemorrhagic stroke. And the good news was she died doing exactly what she loves. She was hiking. Oh. And she was 85 and she just fell back, but I'll never regain her consciousness really. And then when you talked about it with me personally, I had just been through it with my sister's mother-in-law and I didn't know about it. And then just about three weeks ago, I was in New York and I was having coffee with a friend who I had not seen in a long time. And her father has recently passed of Parkinson's and I asked how her mother was doing. And she said, well, my mother had a bleed when she was 51. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, she had a hemorrhagic stroke. She was, how do you know what that is? And I said, I just narrated an audio book about this. And she was like, please give me all the information I need. Mm -hmm. And her mother is still alive. And her mother does have some physical limitations, but she's very present. And she's out doing her gardening every single solitary day. It was interesting to me how this was something that I didn't feel that I knew anything about. And yet suddenly it was around me. She talked about, you know, I was so lucky that my mother survived. And, and she started repeating some of the same facts. And I was like, I know about the, I didn't want to tell her, but I was like, I know about yeah. these facts because they're in the book. <laughs> but it was amazing. And she was like, I need to, I need to listen to this book. I need to read this book. Oh, so, um, you know, it's a very powerful subject that you handled very vulnerably and with such humanity. And I think there'll be a lot of people who will get a lot from it. Thank I really, you. I really do. Thank you. But it t tell them that um, we also have the Don't Count Me Out podcast that we do. And we have a Facebook group. Yeah, in order to find us, it's dcmo.talk. Okay. Don't Count Me Out is just too yeah. long to talk. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Melinda, I think we're almost out of time. Thank you for having me. I'm so oh. glad I got to meet you and chat with you in person. Oh, just... I'm, I hope we have more conversations yeah, in the we future. Will. I certainly will encourage any of my author friends, and they write all different kinds of books, and if they're looking to make sure that they go in and do their, their homework and find someone that is going to do a wonderful job. Of course, I would always suggest Melinda. <laughs> She's pretty good at what she does. Thank you. In fact, um, what we're going to do when we, when we end the show, we have something that's called a sample. It's about four or five minutes long, and it's for us to be able to send to people so that they get a flavor of what the book is about. See, this whole experience is new to me, too, mm -hmm. especially the marketing side of it. Holy moly. It's being distributed by apps like Apple and Audible and wow. Barnes and & Noble, and they don't have it on there. You have a favorite app that you use for your audio books, let them know that you'd like to see it on there and they'll mm -hmm. make sure that they put it on there for you. It's an exciting time. It's it is. New. And I have such great admiration that you have done this and that you have this podcast that you have so much going on. It's just, you're very inspiring. And I hope, I hope Thank you know you. that. I hope that you know that how inspiring you are to a lot of people. I think I keep running too fast to even think about it. <laughs> you know, I see someone else and that's where I feel my passion and my love is, is helping other people. We can get better. And so that's why every time we end our shows, we always end it by saying, Thanks for watching, everybody. We hope you enjoyed the show. My name is Bob Borth with Joanne Glenn. And remember, don't ever count us out. Have a great day. God bless. It's inspiring. It truly is. I'm so, and I truly, I don't know how, I, no other word to say, talking to you has been great. And thank you so much for allowing me to be here. Thank really. You. I pulled into the hospital's massive campus and slowly made the loop around the ER's parking lot. Not one open parking space. Not one except in the no-parking zone reserved for ambulances only. My heart was beating through my chest, not because I was sick, but because I was about to break the law. Me, who uses turn signals in our driveway at home. Parking in this forbidden spot was crossing the line.
driving to the hospital in the throes of a stroke seemed rational to someone with an adult brain. Charging into a reserved parking space? Not so much. I did it, against what little good judgment I had left. I pulled in and turned the car off like I owned the place. This act of defiance made me feel like a character from the cast of Grease. I would have snapped my fingers if I could have still moved my hand. It took a moment to get my balance after I slid out of the car. I leaned on the door with my right side as I locked it with my left hand. I caught sight of my face in the rearview mirror just as the security patrol cart pulled alongside me. Lady, you can't park here, the officer said with authority. It's for ambulances only. I turned and looked at him and watched his expression shift from horror to curiosity. My shoulders slumped as dramatically as a Colorado ski slope. My arm and my hand swung freely with no purposeful direction, and the right side of my mouth appeared to sag and melt like a timepiece in a Salvador Dali painting. I think I'm having a stroke, I slurred. He began to back his cart away, and with the professional countenance of a deputy Barney Fife from the Andy Griffith show, he said, Don't worry about your car, sweetie. I'll keep an eye on it for you. Thank you, is what I'd hoped to say, but remained silent. A little help to the door would have been nice. I watched him roll away in a specially marked golf cart. Ironically, his leaving made me think this situation may not be as bad as it seemed. I took 20 robotic steps to the hospital's ER entry. The large double doors opened automatically with a loud whoosh of air. Apparently, the man behind the counter heard this entrance song many times before. He continued writing his notes. Eventually, he glanced at me over the stack of papers on the corner of the nurse's desk, positioned between us. He blinked his eyes in disbelief. I was beginning to feel weird. I felt as though I were standing next to myself in the middle of the foyer. I said, one last time as loudly as possible, I think I'm having a stroke. The nurse, who was standing with her back to me, twirled around and in a hoarse whisper blurted out, She walked in here? I stood frozen in place as faceless people came running toward me from every direction. A chatter of calls rang out over the intercom. Code blue, code blue. Someone gently rolled their arms under mine, and as my legs collapsed, this stranger lifted me onto a gurney. A sense of euphoria filled my body and blinded my senses. One tear plummeted from the corner of my eye. I sighed with relief. I made it. The cart ride from the hospital's entrance to the exam room transported me into an unfamiliar dimension, one farther from the everyday reality we all know and live. The aide wheeled me through dimly lit halls. Recessed lights in the ceiling blurred into a steady cadence of white flash to shadow. A bockety wheel on the gurney sent a vibration through the rubber mattress. I felt like a living rap song. Three counts of metal clatter, one beat of silence. I began to beat a four-four rhythm with my wedding band on the handrail and tried a fft. But all that happened was my tongue periodically stuck out of a grotesquely shaped face. Are you okay, ma'am? The aide asked. I nodded and closed my eyes. <laughs> 